hypothesis, test it, and share their findings. And there's more details and photos as well uh, that are linked uh, to the website and social media. Uh, we celebrated homecoming week during the last week of September. Our high school students were excited for the return of homecoming festivities like spirit days, pep assembly, football game, and the dance on the new turf field. We were also able to gather as a Monona Grove community on Friday for the homecoming parade. And again, a uh, link to photos from uh, the event and the pep uh, rally. And yesterday, uh, Monona Grove High School hosted a unique track event with some former high school athletes from the 1971 state relay team to mark the 50th anniversary of their race and the last time the state tournament was held at Monona Grove, the Columbus 880 relay team recreated their winning race on our new track. The relay team was joined by their head coach at the time, members of the 1971 Baraboo track team, as well as Tom Clement, son of John Clement, who was MG's athletic director at the time and who played an instrumental role in bringing the state track meet to Monona Grove. 2021 also marked 30 years since the renaming of the athletic complex for John Clement. And there's a video uh, created by our Monona media crew, as well as coverage from WKOW in Madison. Thank you, Dan. Uh, correspondence and announcements. But, Lorraine, can I just ask, so Dan, when there's an event like that at the high school, is there any way that the board can receive notification of that? Because again, because of where I went to high school, I crossed with this high school a lot and would have enjoyed seeing that, I think. Yeah, and certainly when we have public events, we, we always try to do the best we can to, you know, uh, um, you know, invite guests. Um, in this case, um, yeah, this was a, a, a small event, um, and uh, so sure, we can make sure make, try to make it a part of that in the future. Well, and again, we know the Clement family, and so it's nice to be able to have been there and have been able. To, anyway, if if you could just kind of let us know when it's, you know an anniversary like that, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. All right, uh, next is correspondence and announcements. Okay, nothing this evening. Okay, uh, next is administrative reports. Okay, I'd like to start by uh, introducing um, our principal at Teller Prairie, Emily Foster, who will uh, has a team of teachers with her this evening. Um, one of the things that we'll be doing over the next few months is uh, the board will receive a report from each of our school teams to talk about uh, some of the programming that's occurring in the schools, an opportunity for you as well to meet, um, again, you know, certainly the principals, but as well as some of their staff and some of the things that they're working on. So um, they're all with us this evening. So with it, I'll turn it over to Emily. All right. Thank you, Dan. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having us. We're very excited to share um, the work that's been happening at Taylor Prairie. And like Dan said, School Board Appreciation Week was last week. We appreciate you all and thank you so much for your dedication and hard work and commitment to our students and staff and community. I um, am really fortunate to have several amazing colleagues join me tonight. So I will have them introduce themselves. I'll call on each person. Um, Allison, do you want to start? Hi, I'm Allison Whita, teacher on special assignment at Taylor Prairie. And May. Hi, I'm May Fruling. I teach kindergarten at Taylor Prairie. Karis. Hi, I'm Kara Sporsma, and I teach kindergarten music at Teller Prairie. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Steine. I teach 4K at Taylor Prairie. Elizabeth? Hi, I'm Elizabeth Wodzinski, and I'm our library media specialist. And Jessica? Hello, I'm Jessica Wells. I teach 4K at Taylor Prairie. All right, so Taylor Prairie is um, really fortunate to have 272 amazing, beautiful, 
joyful, creative, fun-loving 4K and kindergarten students in our school this year. And we really wanted to kick off the year by defining ourselves as a 4K and kindergarten building. So you know that Taylor Prairie has always had a focus on serving primary age students, but this year especially we are serving simply those 4K and kindergarten learners and giving them their very first school experience in the Cottage Grove community. So we kicked it off by creating a shared vision statement as a coordinator team. And we looked at our district vision and mission because we wanted to align with that as well as our non-negotiables. And we also thought about what we know and believe to be true about teaching and learning young children. And so this is the vision that we came up with and I can read it. Taylor Prairie School is a student focused, play-based inclusive environment where all stakeholders feel safe, welcomed, valued, connected and supported and embrace the belief that differences are not only welcomed, but celebrated as students discover who they are while rising to high expectations. So we revisit this vision during every staff meeting and staff as individuals have kind of pulled pieces that really resonate with them and their own why. And we believe that circling back to our why really often can help us stay motivated and grounded in what is truly important. And it also gives us kind of a common language and we can hold ourselves and each other accountable to our why and to our school-wide vision. So what we're gonna to do tonight is each staff member here um, will take pieces of this vision and talk about how this vision is beginning to unfold and come to life within our school walls. So we'll kick it off with um, Elizabeth and she's going to talk about the piece that focuses on student-focused play-based learning. So I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you. These pictures show our makerspace. And our makerspace is an active place where learners engage in hands-on learning and exploration. Sometimes classes have whole group activities related to a grade level standard. And other times our learners just have open-ended time for making an imaginative play. But every time they're in the space, our learners are cooperating problem solving and playing. For this part, this is our student focused and play based. In the article is play a privilege or a right? And what's our responsibility on the role of play for equity in early childhood education? Mariana Saudo Manning wrote, we must reject the framing of play as a privilege and must reclaim it as the right of every child. Play is a powerful medium for learning. In play, children enact the three Fs of childhood, friendship, fantasy, and fairness. They learn about diversities, engage with familiar and unfamiliar materials, and share their own perspectives and experiences while considering others. In play, children are agents, they are doers. As Albert Einstein said, play is the highest form of research. Children collaborate and make discoveries through play. They author stories, they take risks, they engage in resistance, they learn. The pictures that you're looking at show our 4K students learning and discovering through play. In 4K, our students become engineers and mathematicians and scientists and so much more. As 4K staff members, we know that our students can meet standards and district goals through facilitated play. And here you see our 4K students working together to design and create and engage in play in our classroom apple orchards. Throughout the process, students worked on hand strength and fine motor skills, literacy skills, language, and numerous math skills, such as counting, number recognition, and subitizing. And most importantly, they gained experience with social emotional skills. So they worked together, they problem solved and participated in role playing. And this is a small sample of the supported play opportunities that our 4K students have each day they come. And we're so proud of the learning that they're doing. Our 
Another way that we are focusing on students and the aspect of being play based is through our kindergarten classes piloting a recess project, which is based off of the link project, which was a project developed in Texas. The link project supports the development of the whole child through bringing awareness to social emotional health and behavioral well being, as well as academics. There's a lot of research that indicates the importance of play for children. One article from Playworks indicated that play is critical for healthy child development, as it is a safe way for kids to experiment and practice building relationships and cooperating with others. Fostering safe, inclusive communities that allow for skill development are crucial for all learners. Play can be a tool for healing as physical activity has many benefits on cognitive health, social health, and emotional health. Play also supports self-regulation and develops pro-social skills. Play is a natural, safe way for kids to build relationships and trust, practice empathy, and be physically active. In its simplest form, play is a joyous experience, which encourages laughing and smiling. When kids experience those emotions, their bodies produce oxytocin, which mitigates the negative impacts of trauma. So piloting this project ensures all students have access to uninterrupted play during different parts of their day. As part of this project, a team at Taylor Prairie has been collecting some data um, before implementing the pilot. And um, the data is observational data as well as some student time on task and collecting anecdotal notes from teachers. And um, a big emphasis of this project is if you look at um, the image from an Ed Leadership article, it considers available instructional time compared to the actual time students are engaging in active learning. So taking a closer look at that, we really want um, and hope to see a goal of piloting this project is not only there's so many benefits that can come with play, but also when students are in the classroom learning, they're fully engaged on task and um, really engaged and excited to get their hands on in the learning. So by providing students with additional opportunities to play, we anticipate, anticipate an increase in pro-social skills, emotional skills, cognitive and behavioral engagement. Another part of our vision is um, providing an inclusive environment, and this is not limited to Taylor Perry. This is definitely a district-wide um, goal that we want all of our students to feel celebrated, seen, and heard within our classrooms. So we work together to make plans for students um, for them to be successful right out of the gate. So we work with teams of teachers. There's a lot of people around the table in the room putting their heads together to proactively plan to meet the needs of a range of learners in our classroom. So an example of this that happened recently is that speech and language pathologists created a video that where they were modeling a teaching strategy. And this strategy was not only good, great for students with IEPs, but also um, just a wonderful strategy for all of our learners. So it's really a time when teachers can come together, learn from one another. They all bring so many talents to the table. So it's a great um, opportunity for that just-in-time learning, learning together before the plan goes out in front of the students. This is definitely an area that we are still working on though. We're continuing to reflect on our co-planning process, refine it, make it better, learn through our district ICS uh, professional development days, and then apply that learning to what's happening with our co-planning teams at Taylor Prairie. So another part of our vision is all stakeholders feel safe, welcomed, valued, connected, and supported. Um, so students and staff at Taylor Perry have been working very hard uh, to create an environment in which we see ourselves and others. Um, so relationship building has been our top priority to ensure students feel welcomed and connected at school. Um, students have helped create their environment. For example, um, in the first picture where it says room 19, 
um, students in my class have helped decorate the walls. So they've had a say in how their classroom environment will look because that's where they're gonna be learning. And this is seen you know, throughout the school. Um, they've also helped create collages and different pieces of art, um, displaying different art or displaying different skills that we've been learning. Um, so at the beginning of the school year, students also helped create um, school expectations for staying safe at Taylor Prairie. And an important part of students and staff feeling safe and valued and supported at Taylor Prairie is social emotional learning. And our school has put a major emphasis on um, social emotional learning and we have focused in on learning the zones of regulation. And the zones of regulation is a framework and curriculum that teaches scaffolded skills to build awareness of feelings and um, use of variety of skills tools and strategies for regulation, uh, pro-social skills, self-care, and just overall wellness. Um, the zones provide common language um, to categorize the different ways that we are feeling or our states of alertness through four different colors that you can see um, in those pictures. And we have incorporated SEL in our morning meetings and throughout our day and focused a lot in our co-planning on how we can meet the needs of all of our young learners. Um, so we've worked really hard on teaching these four zones and what our body might look like and feel like in each zone. And we have seen a lot of growth with our students in recognizing and naming their feelings and which zone that they are in. Another one of the ways we build school and family partnerships and connections so that we feel connected and supported is through the use of the Seesaw app. In 4K, the Seesaw app is primarily used to connect with families, share learning um, about what's happening at school, and for learners to get positive feedback from their family. In kindergarten, we see a transition to learner ownership, and that's because of growing technology skills. In kindergarten, we use our guiding information technology literacy standards to emphasize creative technology skills. That means our learners are creating and not consuming technology at school. Uh, an example of this is the little kindergartner on the right side of your screen. She's learning how to take a good photo with her iPad. It's a really simple foundational skill, but it's one that's going to serve her across the content areas throughout the year as she wants to share more of what's happening at school. And as Elizabeth said, in 4K, we use Seesaw as a parent communication tool. So we share photos and videos related to the learning happening in the classroom. After our experience during virtual learning and now having a device for every student, Students are also able to document their learning through Seesaw activities. This is then shared immediately with families. And this provides families with a view of the learning occurring in the classroom and provides talking points to discuss their child's school day. Seesaw is also used to send families communication about 4K goals and ways to support these goals at home. Some of the ways we are working to ensure all staff feel safe, welcome, valued, connected, and supported include providing opportunities for staff to experience joy. We know that it's so important for our staff to feel safe and welcome and valued and connected and supported. And when they feel that way, it has a positive impact on student learning as well. So each month staff are invited to participate in our monthly Taylor Prairie Super Staff Calendar. There's an example on the screen. The Super Staff Calendar provides staff opportunities um, to value, support, and show gratitude for others by participating in um, something that we call Cheers for Peers, where um, we have a bulletin board in our workroom and staff can write a cheer to acknowledge um, a peer. And um, we've also done things like write a positive note. Um, so just leaving a positive note in someone's mailbox. We also um, provide opportunities for feeling safe, comfortable, and connected on Take It Easy Tuesday, where staff can wear comfy clothes and engage in wellness opportunities after school. You can see a few photos here from some wellness opportunities that were offered at the beginning of the year, and those have continued um, since then every Tuesday. 
um, which are also led by members of our staff. We also work to celebrate and acknowledge other heritages and cultures by learning more, sharing on the announcements and reflecting and recognizing the contributions of others and making those connections for our learners and our staff. We've also worked on showing appreciation and support for various staff members on days such as National School Custodian Day and National Food Service Employee Day, where students and staff have made posters, cards, or just greeted um, those staff members with kind, thankful words um, throughout the day to show our gratitude. I think you got to go back two more, right, Allison? Yes. So another way that you have probably already heard and seen some examples of differences being welcomed, but also celebrated, um, here we're sharing about um, some of the work that we're doing to make sure that those differences are acknowledged and welcomed and invited into our um, building at Taylor Prairie. And some of this work has been done through Dr. Goldie Muhammad's um, book, Cultivating Genius. Some of our staff members did a book study this summer, and we also did some work last year, some professional development, where we began some foundational exploration of her um, framework. And Dr. Goldie Muhammad says, teaching culturally and historically responsive literacy means going deeper than simply cultivating skills. Literacy has to be connected to action. So this includes teachers being intentional when exploring their own identity and who they are, who their students are, and who they are together as a classroom community. Um, in addition to, as I said, the many examples that you have probably already seen, May is going to share a few more examples of how she is, um, embracing this work in her classroom and others throughout the building are also working on building identity, skills, intellect, criticality, and joy for our learners. So a few examples of some work on identity that um, has been done in kindergarten um, has been a big focus on learning about our names and a big focus on learning how to say others' names and how important that is, and also learning to advocate for ourselves to make sure others are pronouncing our names correctly. So we made a, pro a class promise to um, make sure to ask others to say their name correctly and um, teach them how to pronounce their name. Um, another example is um, celebrating how special we all are and learning about ourselves and others in our classroom and our school. So um, students created their very own mirror and um, added, uh, looked at themselves in their mirror and added in all of the special things about themselves. And then they were able to share their identities with their classmates. Differences are not only welcomed, but celebrated. In August, when all the leadership teams met, our team decided that an in-person back to school night was not our safest option. When deciding what to do instead, we discussed the goal of back to school night. The ultimate goal is to help the child feel at ease and help their families feel ready for a new school year. After thoughtful discussion, we decided the best way to accomplish this goal was to have individual meetings with every family. We saw the benefit of the individual meetings last year and decided it was something we wanted to do again. The meetings allowed us to meet our new students and their families and answer any questions or concerns the family had. The meetings also allowed us to talk with our students and find out more about them, their likes, their interests, what they want to learn about, and that way we could better plan and help engage them in their learning right away. All staff have stated it was a wonderful experience and helped everyone feel better about the new school year. Another way we are welcoming and celebrating differences is through our monthly observances. So each month, Taylor Perry has a monthly observance that highlights a specific cultural group or a topic. And we are creating and sharing school-wide monthly resources for teachers and learners to use throughout the school day. So this example is from September and it shows the resources we use to center 
Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month. We read books by Hispanic and Latinx authors and illustrators. We learned about different cultures and countries, and our learners especially enjoyed learning new words in Spanish. Yeah, so in addition to the resources that are sent out for the classrooms to use, um, the theme is also highlighted each morning in the morning announcements. Um, so with our September theme of Hispanic Latinx Heritage Month, um, it really tied well with our work with identity as well as equity and inclusion work. So students are able to see themselves and others in the curriculum. And this is important because when students see people who look like them or who have a similar background to them, it's very empowering. And when they see others who may be different than from themselves celebrated, it really expands their view of what they think all people can do and be. So if in September you came to the music classroom, you would have seen students listening and dancing to music created by Hispanic artists. You would have seen them singing in Spanish and just celebrating this culture. All right, and the final piece of our vision that we wanted to highlight tonight is the um, need for high expectations for all learners. So our goal this year is that 90% of our Taylor Perry students will achieve mastery on the literacy outs, and those are those essential Common Core state standards. So how will we get there? One thing that uh, we heard loud and clear last spring from staff is that they wanted options for professional development. They didn't want just one pathway, but instead wanted choices. So coordinators worked hard to create some options for them for this year, and coordinators will be facilitating these. One of the pathway options is called building a loving, caring community. A lot of staff members chose this option. And this pathway is really about building relationships and um, supporting student behaviors. So the loving, caring community is an option. And then the other option that we have for staff, uh, we titled equity-based instructional practices. And that's all about leveraging practices that affirm identities and support student agency and application and transfer of learning and really that ownership of their learning. Um, so we will be offering those pathways during staff meetings this year. And we also know that the co-planning is huge in terms of helping our students rise to high expectations. And again, that's that just-in-time learning, learning from each other, kind of learning through um, peer coaching before the lesson is actually carried out with the students. So those are some of our ideas moving forward throughout the year. And I want to thank the teachers here. I mean, just listening to this presentation, even though I knew it was coming and I knew it was in it, hearing them actually talk about it um, really just impressed me so much. They're doing a lot of work in their classrooms to help their students be successful. And um, I could not be more proud of each and every one of them and the entire Taylor Prairie staff as a whole. And our students too, they're doing a great job. They're amazing. Um, we love having them back in the building face-to-face. -face. So thank you all for listening tonight and having us here. We appreciate the collaboration. Thank you, Emily. And thank you to the staff as well. This was a phenomenal pres presentation. And um, I truly appreciate your focus on diversity. Um, I do have a quick question. Are you seeing any great outcomes as a result of this curriculum? Well, I mean, it's still early. Um, I, I think what we are seeing is students having a good time at school and having fun learning and engaged and happy. Um, they, they love being together. They love, the, they love learning through play. And so, I mean, we can see it in terms of observations right now. In terms of our data, we are just starting to look at that. We had a data meeting that today and um, dug into some of the, you know, iReady data and, and academic data. So yeah, I don't, I don't have, um, I mean, it's early, right? We've only been in school 20 plus days, but do teachers, do you have anything to add to that? 
I can add something. Um, I think what really speaks volumes is how safe and happy students are when they're at school. And that's one of the biggest goals that we have for the beginning of the school year. Um, students are walking into a building that for many of them is unfamiliar, um, seeing staff members that they don't know and don't yet trust. And I know for myself in my classroom and the other 4K classrooms, and as I walk the halls and see kindergartners as well, they're feeling safe, they're happy, and they know that they're loved. And I think when we speak about data, that's the most important data that we can be looking for at the beginning of a school year. Thank you, Jessica. All right, are there any other uh, questions from school board members? Elizabeth? Thanks, Lorraine. Um, well, great presentation. You had me at the tagline on the front page where it just said, where play is the work. I wrote it down. I'm like, that is, that's it. You don't have to say anything else. It's brilliant. Um, and I really appreciate, there are a couple of things I really appreciate um, around the, the emphasis around play and also this emphasis you have around joy, which you stated in your, your presentation several times, but it wasn't like explicitly on a slide. And this idea of giving folks permission to, cult to cultivate joy within the learning context, I think is so huge. And not just at a, at a young age, right? Like the research is really clear about play and joy in early childhood in terms of cultivating lifelong learning and good academic outcomes. But something I really wanna emphasize as we sit and think about this as a district is that it's actually also really good for all people, right? It's good for all kids, regardless of their grade level. It's good for all adults to engage in joy and play um, as they do their, their learning. And I think, you all are really a model of how to do that and think about that, how we can transfer that into other spaces where maybe it doesn't come as obvious or as naturally as it may in the early childhood um, arenas where the kids will play whether you want them to or not, right? So you might as well construct the environment to, to be conducive to that. So I thought it was really great. I loved all of the emphasis and intentionality around the DEI work. I love that poster around say my name and say it correctly. I thought the mere identity activity was great. And so, I, so to me, again, another thing I appreciate is the obvious intentionality and embedded nature of the work, right? It's like, we're not just gonna read a book here or read a book there. It's like this really, it's so obviously intentionally thought out and implemented and, and cultivated and collaborative and supportive. And, I just thought, I thought it was great. I think it's amazing. And I just sat there going, well, can I, can I go to kindergarten? Cause I sort of want to show up. <laughs> so if I, if I, if I show up trying to, with a little backpack on, you know, it's cause I'm just trying to sneak in to such a great learning environment. So uh, great, great work for you all. And, and when you said 20 days or 22 days, I'm like, I just went, whoa, seriously, man, you, you all are working incredibly, incredibly hard and have accomplished an incredible amount in a hard year already in such a short amount of time. So amazing I loved it thank you so much Elizabeth I appreciate that I think it was tw is it 28 days y'all on announcements yeah 29 my kids were very excited because okay. tomorrow's 30 <laughs> but who's counting right <laughs> thank you all right Susan I, I just wanted to add there's not much more you can say after Elizabeth has 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 stated to you know how great your presentation was. The other thing that you can feel from all of you is this collaborative work together, communication, um, feeling comfortable with each other, which then manifests itself and helps grow that in children. And um, again, you just exhibited so much of this in the presentation and the work that you do. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Susan Fox? Nope. Yeah, you on mute, Susan. No, we can't hear you, Susan. Still can't hear you. Just channel what you want to say to me and I will say it for you. <laughs> she said her comp computer doesn't show, it's on mute. 
There may be some audio issues with your computer. Try, you could try headphones that might, if you have headphones with a mic that might work. Check their volume. Okay, so she asked us to move on. All right, so it does not appear that we have any other questions. All right, next uh, is a business services report by Jared. All right, um, I would like to report out on our third Friday counts, our enrollment counts. And so just a little background on why this uh, is an important count. So our third Friday count is the official count that actually um, moves forward with giving us obviously what our enrollment looks like this year, um, but it also feeds our revenue limit that gives us the overall um, amount of revenue that we can collect between equalization aid and property taxes. Um, so the, I have two documents attached. Um, one is uh, called the third Friday overall reports which is actually a report that gives you some historical data that goes back to September of 2016. Uh, we do have two different uh, enrollment count dates. We have the third Friday, which is the one I'm reporting out on today. And then we do have the second Friday, which is in January. Uh, so the information that I'm sharing tonight is just regarding the third Friday, um, just to keep comparing apples to apples and cons being consistent as we report out. Um, so what this shows is, is that um, our overall enrollments as of our um, period in time, and it does change daily, we'll have, you know, a few students might um, enroll in or um, decide to move out, or we might have some alternative open enrollment kids um, that will apply, or we might have residents that um, our families are building a house and they need to move to an apartment outside of the district, which then for a while they're classified as non-resident because they're attending as a tuition waiver. Um, so we just take a snapshot as of September 17th, which was our third Friday. Um, so as of that date, we had 3,550 students um, in our buildings. Uh, this does not include the students that have open and rolled out or uh, families that have um, chose to be uh, homeschooled or go to private school. These are truly students that are in our buildings in front of students. Um, it does incorporate some of our virtual learners that are still on the roster because they, we do classify them um, as students in, seat, uh, in seats due to the fact of the, the COVID um, pandemic. Um, one thing that I want to point out, if you remember, so September of 2019 was really our last third Friday before all this stuff really um, went crazy on us. And at that time, we had an overall enrollment of 3,515 students. And it's broken down by non-resident enrollment and uh, resident enrollment. Um, and then September of 20 was our, our third Friday under uh, COVID and schools being at that virtual level. Um, and we had talked about losing about 101 students and uh, we were at 3,449. And so as I reported out a little bit earlier, uh, we're currently at 3,550. Uh, so we have grown overall in total enrollment. However, um, we lost about 101 students on the resident side, and we gained about half of those students back. It's tricky to say, are, did those students come back um, in the concept of, are they with us? Some of them might have moved out of the district, and we've had new families move in. Um, and obviously, we, we track those as much as we can, but there's just lots of moving parts. Um, but when we look at the overall third Friday counts, uh, we're at 3,550 students that are in our seats. Uh, you can look at the data um, and it's broken up by building and then each building shows you residents and non-resident. Uh, just to note the uh, 4K community schools, you'll see that that's a uh, decrease. Uh, note that's not a decrease in um, overall enrollment at the 4K level. Um, if you recall, we only have one 4K site that's in the community right now, and that's at IHF. So that's why there's only um, 32 compared to normally we're in the 90s. Those kids have been absorbed in both Winnequa and Taylor Prairie. And then as you work through, we obviously opened up Granite Ridge. So this is the first year Granite Ridge is reporting. And then some of our schools had great configuration. So uh, when you look at the 
Some of those schools have decreased enrollment. Does not mean that we've lost that many kids, obviously. Um, we've just shifted them around between buildings. So that's the overall reports. And then to get a little bit more specific in how does that look through grade level, um, I did provide a report that's called Third Friday Enrollment by Building and Grade. And that's where I break it down by each building, by each grade, to give you an idea of the number of sections that we offer. Um, how does that, what does that look like for class size average? And then I do list our, our board class size goals, our, our class size guidelines and the goals. I mean, you can, as you can see, um, most of our classes are at the goal or a little under the goal. Uh, we don't have classes at that 4K through 8 level that are hitting the maximum. And so we do have the ability for when some of our families that might have, you know, um, decided to stay with private school or homeschooling, if they decide to come back um, in the middle of this school year, we're not going to experience class sizes being over the maximums that we want to see. Uh, so I think overall planning was really done well in the concept of ensuring that we had enough sections. And obviously that's always a challenge because we didn't know what that was going to look like when we were going through all that with the, the pandemic and COVID and what potentially might happen and not being able to give families an exact answer of, are we going to be back in person? Or are we going to be at a hybrid or are we going to be um, all um, virtual? So the one thing I want to point out is the high school, obviously it varies by class and course. Uh, so we don't have that same report for the overall grade level, but you can see the overall grades um, and what that enrollment looks at the high school. And the same thing with MG21. They don't have it specifically broken down by grade level because obviously they're, they're spread out between different courses within the building. Um, but we're at 3,550 students. So we are up from last year and still up from a couple years ago. Um, obviously, the overall resident growth has slowed down a little bit compared to what our uh, enrollment study looked like a number of years ago before leading into building the new elementary. Um, but we have to remember that we did have a pandemic that slowed a lot of different things down. We do know there's lots of uh, subdivisions that are starting to be happening in Cottage Grove. We are also seeing and watching the developments of some of the apartment complexes that might be being built and Monona, that would affect some of our enrollment as well. So with that, that's my um, overall enrollment report. Thank you, Jared. Uh, Peter, and then Susan Fox. Um, what did you, what, what number did you use for the budget? So for the budgets, we, I used the growth of 20 students. However, we did not meet that um, in the concept of FTEs. So that's uh, something else I should point out. These are actually bodies and seats. And then when we convert it to an FTE for revenue limits, um, our 4K are only counted as a 60%. And then our K through 12 is classified as um, full 1.0. And then there's that three-year rolling average. Uh, so what I can tell you is we missed um, our three-year rolling average by one student, which means that the um, hold harmless comes in. So we will receive the exact same amount of revenue limit capacity that we received the year before. There's no growth on our revenue limit, um, but what we will see growth on is our, our non-residents and receiving additional funding through open enrollments. And then obviously building the budget around the, uh, using some of the ESSER funds to cover um, our building subs, our additional staffing needs that we needed. But the revenue that we will see increased in our district is due to non-resident growth at this point. Thank you. Susan Fox? So can't hear you. Okay. Are there any other <laughs> are there any other questions from board members? Okay. All right. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Uh, next is the superintendent report. Okay, I wanted to give you an update. Um, this data uh, was reported out from Kyle uh, by Nicole and her team in the, in the HR department, an update on the implementation of our, our vaccine uh, policy. So uh, we've been focusing on the communication receipt, you know, making sure that uh, we're making verifications. As you'll see, we now have had 100% of our teachers 
uh, respond uh, to the survey and please with a very high rate of 97.4 percent of all teachers have um, confirmed uh, full vaccination um, and then with the non-teaching staff we're at a pretty high rate as well but uh, we still have uh, some to go as far as completing the survey uh, we have about 90 percent of non-teachers that have responded thus far and you can see that uh, a large majority of those are the people who are not full time in the building. Things like people like non staff coaches, aquatics, you know, employees, uh, sports workers. And so um, we will begin actually reaching out, you know, by phone and, and so on to make sure we connect, you know, not, um, they're not obviously always checking, you know, regular email. So uh, in a really good place, again, Nicole and her staff are working really hard on, on, on uh, this is the priority of, of collecting this data and then having individual content tact with uh, folks, um, you know, who are not vaccinated, as was described, you know, when you the night that you had um, attorney Goodman with with you to talk about how that process works. And so those conversations are happening as well. So um, one of the things I wanted to point out is that that maybe we didn't emphasize so much um, with regard to the policy that was adopted. We had made the recommendation to make this effective December 1st. And the reason for that is, I mean, we have three people working on this, to, you know, for over 600 employees. And so to give time to make sure that we can have those contacts and really give everyone that opportunity, you know, to, to meet this policy. And, and so um, I said, so far, so good as far as being able to, you know, track and, and uh, um, you know, communicate with our staff. So, um, so I'll pause there. Any, any questions on the data with regard to vaccinations? Eric and then Elizabeth. Dan, uh, it's 97.4% of the teachers are vaccinated. How many teachers do we have? About how many teachers in the district? Yeah, great question. So uh, a little, little over 300 total teachers. And so the number of unvaccinated is less than 10. Okay, so we have less than 10 people. And of those 10, do we have information if they've... Um, requested an accommodation for an exemption? Um, I believe Nicole's been in contact. I'm not so sure how much you can say about that. Okay, uh, that's you fine. Know, but, but yes, that they're working okay. through, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Eric, uh, Elizabeth? Dan, have you gotten any feedback from the staff at all? Um, very little, um, just in, in general. Um, the, the only thing I've heard personally has been positive. Now, keep in mind the, the folks who have qu specific questions are all directed you know, to go right to Nicole and her team. So, um, in fact, you know, just with respect to privacy and, and so on, you know, I don't have access to those, those you know, types of records. And so I, I'm not having those same conversations. The things I've heard in general is our staff is, you know, really uh, glad that we have such a high, you know, rate and, 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 uh, um, I think, you know, kind of goes back to, right, not only keeping students safe, our staff wanted to feel safe. So that's kind of the feedback I've received. Um, Great, thank you. Eric? Yeah, Dan, I just, are you done? Was that all you were gonna say about the vaccines? Or was there any more? Yes. Uh, so I, I just got a, another question, um, slightly related with, uh, um, our contact tracing and stuff. And I was just wondering is, is the policies for contact tracing for students that, um, for instance, would be um, next to somebody that tested positive, it, is that clear or is that something that's still being um, developed and kind of uh, situated as, as we move throughout the year as more, more cases happen? Yeah, yeah, no, great question. So um, and you may be aware that the guidance did change um, prior to the school year, what we had last spring, okay? And so it has not changed since that time. We still have weekly meetings with, you know, representatives from public health to go through and, and answer specific questions. Um, but, and, and one of the things that and I think speaking to the whole board, you know, you, um, you received an email recently about a, a question about some of those processes. And so our processes and guidelines are in alignment with public health, CDC, DHS, um, with regard to how that happens. 
Um, we are continually, you know, with the communication, trying to make sure we're consistent with that. Um, so I don't know, Nicole or Krista, thanks for popping on there if you want to add anything, you know, to that. No, just, just to reiterate that they, they are consistent, have been since the start of school, but as Dan said it, there were some um, differences from last year and even from late summer, what we thought we were gonna be doing versus some so, but no, we've not made any changes to our practices since school has, has started. Eric, a quick follow-up question. It, from my understanding, it there may be some confusion because there's differences between for like for instance elementary school where students are not vaccinated compared to like high school where people are vaccinated is that correct because that seems like that might be an area where there's it, it's different is that right Christa? yeah there are a lot of layers to it so that's that's the changes I guess just to be more clear about that there are there's much more flexibility which is great for vaccinated individuals, depending on if they're symptomatic or asymptomatic. Um, the distancing, the allowable three feet versus six feet when two individuals are both effectively masked. And um, you know some of the other, the time of the options, excuse me, for return from quarantine. So there are now three options for returning instead of just the straight 14 day if you're a close contact. Um, so yes, there are a lot of, um, there's more, options and more flexibility, but it is a lot just to navigate. So it's, yeah, it can seem a little overwhelming depending on each circumstance, but the team is, has had a lot of um, opportunity and experience with responding to, to various situations, but it, you know, each one is a little bit individual. So it does require a lot of time and attention. And then just one, oh, go ahead, Susan May. Well, I have similar questions and that is that if someone asks us as a board member what the process is for a student who's exposed to another student or teacher who tests positive for COVID, what is our process? And Dan, before you were giving us almost on you know, a weekly basis, um, the document that, that kind of laid that out for us, and I don't know that we've seen that recently. So as a board member, it would be really helpful for me, particularly when I get a question about it and there seems to be some confusion. Um, if we have that document that tells us if they're exposed, this is, this is how it works. You know, this happens and this happens and this happens. And then when we get a question, and there's confusion, we at least know what the process is intended to be. Sure. Yep. So there has not been any changes to the plan since the last time that we shared with the board. Uh, it is accessible on our, on our website. I can share that out again so you can easily find that, but it is. Um, that would be great. I can find that on the website. I just yeah. didn't realize that, you know, yeah. with 20 days into a new school program that you hadn't made any changes. Okay, so thank you. if we do make changes, we'll certainly share those out with the board. Great, thank you. Okay, Elizabeth. Um, I do wonder, Krista, from like a communication perspective, if there is some opportunities to like simplify or even streamline some of those things. Like, um, like I've also been asked from community members, what's our protocol? And I'm like, I can navigate this document, but I'm also like not in the middle of trying to figure out what to do with my kids because they've been exposed, right? right? So it's, it's a different layer of thing. And like I go on our website and it's just, there's a lot of scrolling, there's a lot of links. And I guess I'm curious to know, have we thought about or talked about like, how do we sort of crisp this and clean this up so it's very clear where to go and even break our guidance up because you know who you are is different, right? unvaccinated versus vaccinated, age level or not, exposure in school versus out, exposure outside of school or whatever. Like, is there a way to like put that really front and center so folks that are trying to navigate can be like, oh, I'm Elizabeth Cook. My kid got exposed on the bus. You, you know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. To kind of simplify and streamline it a little bit. Because while I agree all the information is there, there's a lot of it. Yeah, we had that same thought, and I see Katie just jumped on too. There was a one pager that we sent to families. Um, I don't remember the exact timeline, but it's been a bit a while ago now, and that's on the website as well. Um, just, just kind of with that front and center information, because I will add, every situation 
is a little bit different. So that primary thing is like symptomatic, close contact, stay home, contact your nurse, contact your health department attendants, and every single person gets a response. We monitor that, you know, nights, evenings, and weekends, like, you know, I get them and for them on, we, you know, so we're triaging those. Um, that's the most important part. And I know that's hard because everyone wants to like is you writing out instructions for every single possible scenario, right. you know, we're, we're actually, and I think we're rightfully so that we really emphasize those important things. Like what, what symptoms you're looking for, what it might mean, the broad scope of when a quarantine or, um, or what you need to do, you know, if, if you're sick or need to quarantine, but then really that re that email from your health team member, that's get, gives you explicit information about your particular scenario with dates highlighted and information about your exposure and your timeline. And so that's really the, what, what families can expect to get and is the, the most important communication that they're going to get. Cause it will, it will be based on the overall guidance, which is applied consistently for everyone that will have those nuanced pieces um, for each each scenario. And it's based on um, you know, the information that the families provide to us and or what we provide in return with, when it's a contact tracing situation. That makes sense. I do wonder because families talk, right? If it's worthwhile to take a look at our standard patent correspondences and somehow have like at the bottom, like this is your unique, right? Because it reads like a form letter, right? Uh, understandably so, because it, you know, you're, you've got probably several templates that you pick and choose from and pull on the re related information. But even something around that could be potentially useful. So people know like, this is me. And when I talk to my neighbor across the street and they have something different, it's not because the district isn't consistent in our policies. It's because the situation has been assessed uniquely Right. And to the extent that we can mitigate for some of that. So I think yeah. simplifying as much as possible, making it really clear for folks that like you get individually assessed. And so it might happen in this way for you and this way for your neighbor. And that's all part of the process. I think the more that we can do that and then the more consistent we can communicate out our protocols to, to the general community all the time. I think, you know, maybe we'll try mm -hmm. to assuage some of that confusion. Yeah. And it's hard because, oh, yeah. uh, you know, right. Like we, I will say like it is consistent response. So, you know, like that is one thing we, whatever this, we have been applying the guidelines very consistently. So it's not wiggle room in that way, but what people don't know and that what we can't share for obviously confidence, there's a layer of confidentiality here, right. right? We're talking about individuals' health situations. So you do not know all of the details and we can't right. share them. And that's where I think the, the cross communication sometimes gets frustrating and, but that tagline idea is a good, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Um, well, I don't, I don't envy you all at all. You're doing a great job. I think, I think it's really complicated. That's something I always appreciate about you, Krista in general, is that I feel like you're always really open to feedback um, and making improvements on things. So I, I appreciate that about you just in general. I Thank you. I, just, <laughs> I do see your hand, Susan. Just wanted to ask Katie, did she want to have any additional information to share? No, I agree that it's all, that's really good feedback just to include that, um, you know, it's, it is very complicated based on all of the different scenarios and um, vaccinated, unvaccinated and all, all of those, what the symptoms are, it's, it gets very complex. So making it um, more personalized letters or making it feel like a more personalized letter is a great idea. I did drop in that quick reference because again, Elizabeth, like once school started, I think we all sort of felt the same thing. Like parents don't have time to look through that whole thing every day and memorize and we can't, you know, it's just, it was very hard. So, um, and as all, you know, a lot of parents ourselves here, we're having the same experience. So it is in the chat, it is on the website. We did email that out to all families. Um, and, you know, I, I personally like even have that hanging on my cabinet in the morning and like check it every day and make sure that my kids don't have those symptoms. So, um, it's hopefully a helpful resource and, um, we can, you know, continue to update that if things, if things do change. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Susan Manning. Um, I was just going to ask. So um, Katie gave us in the chat a reference and what came up when I went to that was a one page PDF. Is that what you want me to see? I think one of the questions we had is um, I, the next step, and that is if a student in a classroom tests positive, then what happens? 
I mean, I let Krista take it, but the next step is that the the nurse is in contact with them. So the um, I don't I don't want to get into too many details there, Krista. But then the, then the, the health team staff has communication with that family based on their unique circumstances around, you know, okay. when they tested positive, when they became a symptom. But I'm also talking about I'm not just talking about the student who tests positive. I'm talking about all the other students in the room and in the school. What's the process? If a, if a student sat next to a student on the bus and that's one, one of those students then tests positive in the next 24 hours, um, I, I'm guessing we have a sheet similar to this that says, this is what we do. I was wondering if you were maybe asking about the, the operations plan, if you were wondering that, because that's, that's our main document that Sarah Elizabeth was talking about. The operations plan does list much more detail um, to Katie's point, every scenario is different. So that, that point yes. of contact, whether it's um, public health contacts a family because something happens outside of school or we're informed of something, that kicks off that contact tracing process where we figure out who was in contact, if your child was impacted, if they weren't impacted, and then those families get a, a call from the health team if you were, if your child was considered a close contact in your in your example. Well, in the and in the past, those classrooms are quarantined. We're not doing that. I'm looking for what do yep, we so, do? In got this? it. So that's a really good. I mean, it still is in the operations. There, there could be a time when we would potentially need to quarantine a whole classroom. I, I'm glad you brought that up, though, because that's been a real emphasis of ours for this year. And something I think we're pretty proud of is we've really kept classroom closures to a minimum because of the level of contact tracing the team is doing. And that's a that's a team effort, right? That's teachers having seating charts that they can quickly refer to. It's related arts having seating charts. It's principals checking videos at eight o'clock at night to make mm -hmm. sure and talking to recess supervisors. So that is what the team has really spent a lot of time on. And thankfully, like the staff has really, really responded to that. We, we do, we do regular reminders to our class. We remember three feet, like maximizing that. That's such a priority that keeps kids in school. And so our numbers of close contacts are you know, it, it doesn't matter if it's your child in your situation, because that that still impacts you personally. But in classes of, you know, 20 or 22, if we have three or four close contacts, that's, that's good, right? That's what we're working toward and what we've been having some success with um, this school year. But yeah, it, it is, it's a lot of, um, a lot of work that goes into figuring that out. And we're as careful as we can be and, and safe, you know, safety first, right? So we're, we're feeling pretty good about that with the results we're getting in our data. Great, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Eric? Uh, yeah, just one quick clarification. Um, I wonder if the, because the PCR test is a test that they need to have, is that correct, Krista? And yes. I, I wonder if, you know, people might not understand the difference between the PCR test and the rapid test. Uh, and, and I actually had to just double check myself, make sure what the PCR test was. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it's, it, I don't know, I didn't look at the sheet that Katie sent out, but it might, a terminology might help to define that a little bit more. Um, it, it, it might be helpful. And also, I just want to recognize, Krista, all the additional um, new, new um, things that your job requires with all this contact tracing. And I understand it's a lot of work. And so I, I appreciate um, the time that you're putting into it. Um, but there's still things that need to be, you know, maybe maybe clarified a little bit with it. So yeah, I think we're continually looking at those revisions of the app, and I think we want to be as flexible and responsive as we can. So we'll work with the best information we get, so we're not stuck on being rigid. You did mention the PCR test. I think we're trying to get that language as front and center as possible. Those communications that families get right away, like we're, you know, if your child is sick, like we're letting them know right away that that's that that is the option that's available to them and how to access that. We can just acknowledge that pandemic response is the ultimate duties as otherwise assigned. <laughs> For sure. All right, Chris, there are, doesn't appear to be any other questions, so thank you. All right, uh, next are board reports, uh, ad hoc sustainability committee, Peter. Hi, um, let's see, we met last Thursday. Um, we, we didn't take, we, 
any action. We don't have sort of anything right currently on our plate other than discussion of developing a outreach strategy that um, both for inf informing the, our students and our families and our communities, um, but also so that we can make what we've learned through uh, this process available to um, other educators in other school districts and communities in the state. Um, so we've had some discussions and some productive discussions about generating content and how we can approach that. Uh, but that's, that's what we've been working on lately. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next is Policy Committee, Susan Manning. Yep, I've got it right here. And actually, I would encourage any board members or public members who are available during the time of the sustainability meeting. And Peter actually puts the Zoom link, I think, in the agenda. Um, this is an excellent meeting to watch. And it is really impressive the way his committee has come together and the work that they're doing. And, reaching out to the community. They have plans and action plans. And again, it's very interesting to listen to. And, and I, I have to say inspirational. Um, and you. I enjoy doing it. Thank you, Peter. No, I'm serious. No, thank you. For no, the no, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Don't thank me though. Thank these really thank very, you. very um, engaged and hardworking people that I have that are on this committee yeah. and committed. Yeah, really. Um, and it's very encouraging to, to watch them work. So the policy committee, um, the report for 10, 13, 21, um, the policy committee is presenting board policy 2018 equity and education tonight for a final read and board approval. And the administrative staff has been involved in the um, creation of the policy, has reviewed the policy. The policy committee added some modifications for clarity and is recommending the policy for final approval tonight. Um, it is on the board's agenda for action. The board committee uh, met, the policy committee met on September 22nd and reviewed 10 policies, 10 or 11, that are presented to the board this evening for first read. All Neola suggested amendments presented this evening for first read were reviewed, discussed, validated, and approved. Um, either as presented or as amended by the committee. There were no board amendments received prior to tonight's meeting by the committee. There was one board question on the deletion of the board 0144.2 board member ethics regarding inclusion um, that was of this deleted policy into 0144.5. And um, the committee actually specifically reviewed all the lines that were being deleted to make sure that, that if not the exact words, the concept was transposed to 0144.5. And I went back and double checked that. Um, if any board members uh, see um, a, a difference in that, please let us know because we are meeting next week and would, would be happy to re-review that. Um, the policy committee met again on 10 6 21 and reviewed and approved 12 policies that are also pre being presented tonight for first read. Thank you. Uh, yeah, next yeah. Week, it was pretty tedious. Ask Susan and Elizabeth. To, I mean, we're, we were, we kind of made Dan go through that particular, any deleted policy to make sure the concept and or the language is specifically if it needs to be retained in another policy. And in our notes, in the minutes of our meetings, it tells you where to look for that material. Okay. Uh, next is the Monona Grove Education Foundation, Susan Manning. Well, again, the Education Foundation is just doing a superb work. Uh, um, Dan was unable to attend, so I don't have a report that he gave to, to them that day. Um, Krista came and presented a summary of funding requests from schools, Taylor Prairie, Cottage Grove, Granite Ridge, Glacial Drumlin, and Monona Grove High School. Um, I, I'm not aware if we hadn't, if they hadn't received one from Winnequa or it just wasn't incorporated into that document. These requests were discussed by the foundation board and identified needs for funding 
included snow pants, boots, gloves, hats, socks, underwear, gym shoes, and library totes. Um, the board then did a few action items. They approved Mary O'Connor, Nancy Kugel, and Kathy Klinke for, an, for additional three-year terms on the board. Um, they've approved moving board member Ed Young to emeritus status. He was previously the treasurer. Um, the board will continue to explore an additional year of board service by Kathy Thomas. Um, she's been very involved in the sponsorship work and they're trying to make sure that transitions. The board acknowledged the following board members whose terms will be expiring. Jay Keeper, and he is now returning and he's been a great board member, works at uh, Briar Patch. And Ed Young is moving to emeritus status. Um, they, uh, Kathy Boltman gave a communications report. They continue to work on the foundation webpage and are working, trying to find really strong pathways to communicate with administration and staff regarding their grant funding opportunities. They're also reaching out to communicate with the school PTO. So if you have any ideas about how they can do that better, I'm sure Jason would like to hear about that. Um, Patty Parrott gave a presentation on their major fundraising event this year, the golf ball drop, which actually, if you could attend, was quite fun. Um, they put the fire truck ladder all the way up and dropped golf balls. Um, it, the fundraising effort resulted in approximately $20,000. Um, and Patty thanked all those who helped the Monona Rec Department, the Fire Department, and they continued to discuss um, and we'll be working strongly with administration. So I encourage any staff members or administration to communicate with the foundation on how to identify and utilize these funds to meet student needs, because that's a focus of what they wanna do with those funds right now. Um, and Jane Beebe is gonna be working on the solicitation of grants and um, they are going to be reaching out to building administrators and social workers in terms of student related needs grants. They approved a $20,000 up $10,000 budget for 2022 teacher innovation grants. So I want to make sure staff is aware that they've increased that to $20,000. Um, they've also approved the following budget for play it forward funding student needs funding. $250 to each elementary school, $500 to the middle school, $500 to the high school, and $350 to MG21. Um, the board also discussed how to reach out and determine st student needs for funding for the Play It Forward program. Our next meeting date is November 9th, 2021. They're really doing nice fundraising and they really want pathways um, structured pathways for how to um, allocate these funds to student needs. Thank you, Susan. Uh, next is possible action items. Uh, date, time, place of annual meeting and budget hearing for 2022. Okay, so this is something that annually um, the electors at the, the annual meeting authorize this board to determine um, those three things that statutorily you know needs to be acted upon every year. And so we did put a little bit of information regarding the history since 2019. We've been meeting on the second Monday in September. Uh, we had quite a discussion about that at that time about the timing and you know when we know information about the budget and all that and that seems to, to work pretty well for us. So that's our recommendation to stay with that same date and time. The location is something this board has discussed quite a bit over time. Um, that about whether using the, you know, we, we did use the auditorium one year, of course, when we wanted to be able to have more distancing. The third floor at the district office is the most convenient for our uh, media team for the live streaming, but we have from time to time rotated and had the meeting at one of the buildings in Cottage Grove as well. And that can be done um, also. And so I think as for you as, as a board to decide where you'd like to have that meeting and when uh, for next year. Are there any questions from board members or preferences? Oh. Susan Manning? Jared, this is the date 
that you want us to use, right? I just want to clarify. Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, so I would um, make a motion that the 2022 annual meeting and budget hearing be held on Monday, September 12th, 2022 at 6 p.m. at the district office. Can I get a second, please? I'll second that. All right, any further discussion? All right, roll call vote, Peter? Aye. Eric? Aye. Susan Manning? Aye. Susan Fox? Hi. <laughs> we heard you. <laughs> did you really? Yeah. I. Oh, okay. Well, I did just change one more thing, so maybe <laughs> maybe it's going to work now. And <laughs> Sorry, Marie, aye. Ayes have been. Motion is carried. All right. Next is the policy adoption second reading, and then I will. Okay. I'm sorry. Should we read any of the? I'll just let you take over. Susan Fox. Um, oh, for the policy, you mean Susan Manning? Susan Manning, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I'd be more than happy to have her be continue to be chair of policy. Um, again, I think we've already talked about this is the second reading for, of the um, equity and education policy. Actually, probably if people want to hear that history for second or third time, I think Dan can do that because he actually kind of organized that and put that forward and then brought it to the committee for review. Um, the policy committee and administration and significant staff who worked on this recommend the adoption of the new policy 2018 as presented. So I would move that we adopt New policy 2018 as presented. Okay, second. I have a second. All right. Any further discussion? All right, we can go ahead and do a roll call vote. Peter? Aye. Eric? Aye. Susan Manning? Aye. Susan Fox? Aye. Elizabeth? Aye. Lorreen? Aye. Ayes have it. Motion is carried. Okay. Uh, next are discussion items. So 4K wraparound care proposal. Okay, so I think we've made mention at a previous meeting that we have a team that has been exploring the option of some wraparound care for our 4K students. And what we'd like to do tonight is just give you an update on the progress of where we're at at this point. This is discussion only. It's not a proposal for action at this time. We're looking for some board feedback before we move on and continue our, our planning. So uh, just kind of a check in, you know, with the status. And so we do have a, a short two page document that kind of outlines uh, the work that we've come up with uh, at this point, as far as what this uh, program might look like. And uh, so the team that's been working on this, um, Emily Foster, of course, our principal at Taylor Prairie, who also coordinates our 4K programming for the district. Uh, Krista Foster has been a part of that team, uh, Jared Rosing, um, as well as Lisa Hype has joined us um, uh, as we've done our planning. So uh, we're each going to take a little bit of a part to talk a little bit about this planning process, and then we'll uh, uh, open it up for questions and discussion. So um, to talk a little bit about where this came from and why there are, you know, what those needs might be, uh, Krista is going to kick us off. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, and for those of you who are newer to the board, um, par partially my desire to be part of this conversation, my, my history, my other life, I worked for a long time in 4K and early childhood, um, specifically with Taylor Prairie and the Cottage Grove community, but district-wide in that early childhood school psych role. And so um, early childhood education, preschool, young children is definitely um, a passion area of mine and something that I th I'm just proud of the work that we've done here in the district. So. Um, I mentioned that because this, this conversation has been sort of a long time coming in terms of um, us recognizing and, and the various teams that have worked in this area over time, um, recognizing a couple of things which and hearing from our community about just how challenging 
um, it can be to have access to, um, I'll talk like really specifically like wraparound care for half day 4K programming, which is what we've offered. I mean, that is not, it's not a Monona Grove unique um, need that is a sort of statewide in our case and societal um, need when it comes to accessibility of childcare. That's a conversation for another day. But specifically for our 4K program, when it comes to um, our goal of developing a quality, high quality um, preschool program, early childhood 4K um, program, we want that to be accessible by as many of our as, as many of our community members um, as possible, and to be able to accommodate all those who want to attend. So um, we know a big factor for accessibility is that wraparound um, care for for that half day program and um, making that as accessible as possible for our families. So while we can't certainly um, manage the entire community and, and that whole piece, the things we've been paying attention to are requests from families or wonderings or just the problems all we do about making, making it um, something that is uh, available and accessible for families. And over time, we've noticed too, um, you know, 4K, there aren't a lot of standalone preschool options in our specific communities either. So um, separate from childcare opportunities, which certainly um, uh, are preschool standards and have good access and opportunities, those standalone options, we've, we've lost a few over time and there really are some pretty limited, especially within our actual district boundaries, there's almost none. Um, so again, just another a point to sort of emphasize and, um, you know, you heard, I'm, I'm glad we we're having this conversation tonight after you got to hear from the Taylor Prairie team and get a feel for what they're doing there. And, you know, they really sort of stated um, all the reasons why we want our families to be able to participate in 4K, um, if at all possible. And that transition piece, we know with our youngest learners, um, the fewer transitions, the better the, that we're asking them to do. These are some of our youngest learners and sometimes they're going to two or three places during the day and, and having to navigate their first school experience and all of that. Um, so one goal of the program is to just make that um, less of a transition for those who um, need that. And then I think those school family partnerships is on, the, is on our handout as well. And I think that's just the again, you heard from the Taylor Prairie team tonight, they are starting that as early as possible. And this is just one other way to sort of um, build and reinforce that bond between school staff and families. And we know that with these youngest children, that that's such a critical part of kicking off your, your school career. So we just thought this was another, um, that's another reason we're advocating or thinking about um, offering this opportunity. And then finally, practically, um, we haven't had the space to even consider, like we've thrown ideas around, around preschool opportunities and rep care and um, creative ideas over time in various ways. And we've never found ourselves in a position where we've actually had the capacity to potentially plan and offer something. So when Emily um, sort of initiated this and brought it up, it was just really exciting to be able to talk about something that we could potentially um, pull together. So. All right. Uh, Susan, Manny? Hey, Chris, I think this is wonderful. I strongly support this program. I think it's great that you're doing it. I'd like us to do it in both 4K sites as it evolves. Um, I just think this is great. Um, I've been advocating for this for years and I, I just thank you so much for bringing this forward. And absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And Emily, Emily will talk more about it too. So, I, and I, we, I do want to be cautious. I probably didn't use the word the pilot, right? So we, you know, pilot. we want to figure this out and, and yes, um, I think there's a lot of growth opportunity within this idea that you'll hear about tonight. Well, and the wonderful thing is you've got a principal who also has been in the other building where we offer 4k. So as you work on your model, if there's transition, you'll have an experienced person to, to help work with that. I, I think this is great work. Thank you. Uh, Susan Fox. Um, two things. One, I guess one of the reasons I'd always heard for our not doing it in addition to space was separate licensing requirements that it was a whole different thing with a lot more restrictions. So that's one question. And then the other one is about space. Um, do we have space at, at Winnequa if we decide to go forward with this? Because I, I do think it's a real need in both communities. So I'm, I'm excited about the fact that we're doing it, but uh, just wondering about those two things. 
So in checking about the licensing, um, I contacted a person from, um, well, I don't think DPI, but I ha I'd have to double check my source here, but I uh, had been emailing with her and, and she said, if we don't expect to receive state funding, then there wouldn't be um, the licensing or regulation that's required typically like a, a child care center would have. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, that there are all kinds of things you can't do in some licensed mm -hmm. centers. And I, I had always heard that was one of the impediments. So if it isn't for us, that would be great. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the space at Wenequa, that's becoming an increasing concern as I look at those numbers and yeah. um, just wondering where we are with that. Sure, I, I can speak to that. And, and we'll certainly be talking about that as we do every year, right? When we get into January and look at open enrollment space. And at Winnequa, um, it really, the one thing that, that, that we'll really have to work hard on these next couple of years um, is the 4K um, open enrollment. You know, we, number one priority, of course, is having space for our resident kids in Monona at Winnequa, which we believe we have plenty of space, even with the increase of enrollment that we've seen. Um, so that, that's going to be tricky. In most years, there is an available class, extra classroom at Winnequa. But if we have several years in a row of five section grades, then, you know, we'd, um, it'll be a problem. So that's something that um, if we dedicate a space, then we're going to have to be really careful in monitoring that enrollment to make sure that, you know, we're able to maintain. So that's something I can't, I can't say that it's a guarantee we have space, but it's, it's a possibility that we could create a space in Winnipeg. Well, and of course, the other thing to be thinking about a little bit in the future, but I think only a year or so is Maywood. I mean, that'll be coming up. I didn't want to say that out loud, but uh, that totally filled Nichols. I mean, because Nichols is really not an option anymore, I don't think. But um, but uh, anyway, just something to keep in the back of our minds. That's 2023, right? That that comes up? I mean, that that'll be empty? Uh, yeah, if, I believe if, so. If, yeah, okay. Okay. And we, well, if, we, if it's okay, we have a little bit more we'd like to talk about, and then oh, we'll certainly can take more questions. So um, so Emily, I'd like to talk a little bit about the specifics about what this would look like. Sure. So just a very tentative overview of this pilot project. We are we really want to make sure that we're clear that this is child care. It's not an extension of the 4K day. It's not educational programming. It is another child care option. So um, we need to make sure that line is pretty clear. We can utilize rooms 21 and 22 in, at Taylor Prairie. And the, that's nice because there's a wall that can open up so that those um, spaces, so that it can become one large space and have its own entrance so that we don't have to have um, children going through the main office area. Um, the other piece is that we're thinking we could serve 40 students total for this pilot project. So that would mean 20 in the morning, 20 in the afternoon, based on when they uh, attend 4K. So you have an example draft schedule in front of you in the document. Uh, the hours would be seven o'clock to 2.50 would, would be when students would either be in their 4K classroom or attending this childcare option. They could be picked up at 2.50 or we were thinking that they could stay late, uh, pay an additional fee, and stay 250 to potentially five o'clock. So that's kind of what we're thinking in terms of the day outline. Um, and then moving to the next part of it, obviously there's always a financial cost that comes along. Um, and so as we continue to work through this, I think the biggest uh, difference, and you know, obviously to answer Susan Fox's question is about licensing, and knowing that uh, Emily has worked and talked with DPI, um, you know, when, when we say that we can do some of these things and have different licensing because we're not accepting state or federal funding, is due to the fact that these uh, this program would be run out of Fund 80, um, which we don't count these students as, um, you know, enrollment towards our you know revenue limits. It's completely outside of the revenue limits. Um, and I've actually had the opportunity um, prior to coming to Monona Grove to work in a school district that offered a similar program was classified as school age care. And um, so having a little understanding of how that fits into fund 80 has been helpful. 
Um, right now, you know, obviously we continue to explore. It's, it's a pilot. We're not for sure. We do believe that we'll probably fill up the, the 40 spots. Um, however, we're, we're exploring um, program fees of approximately $120 to $150 per week for families. And then as Emily has stated, the opportunity for families to stay after that $250 when school is released, um, approximately $50 to $75. And, and we haven't nailed that down. We are looking at other programs across the state to see what they offer. And obviously, the expenditure side of things is going to you know, sort of run what our fees need to be. Um, having it and run and fund 80, we do have the ability if we need to, um, you know, tap into some of those other fee areas within fund 80. Um, but obviously the goal of it is, is to break even it, it's, a, it's a nonprofit pro program. And so as we look at the staffing side of things and based on the, the pilot number of looking at the, you know, the two lead childcare providers and two assistants, they both are, all four of them would be hourly, depending on, you know, what does that look like? Um, benefit wise, if they need benefits. And so we continue to work through that. Obviously a pilot program requires us to have some initial cost uh, that we might not have as we expand this, you know, once we get certain supplies um, purchase, obviously the toy concept consumables will be an on, you know, an annual basis going forward. And then obviously developing that uh, preschool materials and resources that the, the daycare uh, providers would need um, when it comes to the, the food, the snack side of things, the one thing that we know that we will incorporate into the program is providing a snack that will be taken out of the, uh, you know, the fee that is paid by the families. We are looking into the opportunity of how can we provide lunches? Because obviously if the students are there for the whole day, you know, do we ask families to pack the lunch? We would like to be able to incorporate that into our school nutrition program. Uh, we're still exploring that. Obviously, right now we know that you know um, any child can get a free meal. However, we want to make sure that what what however we set the program up, it's not like oh this is a one time deal for lunches and then it's not happening the following year. So we do, we're working through some of those types of things. Um, and right now, when we say the concept of no busing for the pilots, obviously families that sign up for 4K, and if they're if they are in the 4K morning session, they would qualify for busing to school. If they choose not to participate in the wraparound care, they obviously would be provided transportation at midday. If they decide to stay, uh, we just would not be able to provide transportation at the end of their wraparound care. And same thing for if they're an afternoon session, they won't get transportation at the seven o'clock time when other kids are coming in. Um, they would obviously get transportation if they were coming just for the PM session. Uh, and then obviously the afternoon, if they go home right away, when the bus is run, they would qualify. So it just, uh, and we're exploring that uh, right now due to the bus driver shortage, we don't want to be adding some different things there. If we could offer transportation, we want to be able to do that, but we're working through some of those logistical things is because obviously the uh, daycare program, even though it's run under the school district, you know, how are those students recorded at Infinite Campus? If there was an emergency, how do we ensure we know where those students are going and how do we get them on a bus? If a bus is running late, how do we ensure that those kids are on certain uh, lists because they're not an active attendee of the 4K through 12th grade program? Uh, so we just need to work through some things with Infinite Campus. And so as a pilot, we figured it was just best to start with the no busing. We can add it, great. Uh, we would just hate for people to sign up for busing and not be able to get it and then have to back out of the program. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, quick question. When would we want to start? Yeah, so, you know, in, in the last couple of bullet points, the next steps, um, you know, we built pretty we're pretty confident there'll be strong interest, but we definitely would like to do an interest survey and just kind of confirm what interest would be out there. And we'll use the word, you know, preliminary, tentative and, and all that, but to make, you know, kind of confirm that. Um, a best case scenario, we would love to be able to start this right after the winter break in January. You know, that that's our goal. So all the things that we've talked about that we need to pull together, uh, if we can do that, that would, that I think would be the optimal time. 
Great. Two more questions. Since we're thinking about, so for, first of all, I think this is great. This is a great idea. I think Jared and I have talked about this for a long time, and I would love to see this pilot be successful and I'll start to think about what it looks like for us to provide wrap care outside of just the 4K setting, but I recognize we got to start small and this makes sense. So that was just pin that one for my enthusiasm later. Future enthusiastic, Elizabeth. Um, a question, this is actually for you, Krista, or maybe for Dan. Are we concerned about further burdening our health services staff? Because now we've added another element as it relates to contact tracing potentially in COVID protocols. I mean, fair question, right? Um, however, I think because I think we would mirror our same protocols, right? I mean, I think, we, I think we have a pretty good handle on what our protocols are and how that's worked with our current um, Fort Clay classrooms and, you know, Katie and I and others just kind of paying attention to what the, the data look like for those youngest children. So um, we've thought about that for sure. And, you know, it is just a different, but since the students are also in 4K, um, you know, it's not necessarily like double the, you know, double the risk for kids that wouldn't necessarily be together. There'd be some more potential cross contact, but I think with the protocols we have in place and the space we have available and the ability to, um, train staff to follow those, I think we're feeling okay about that. Great. And then last question, this one's for you, Jared, as we move through the pilot, um, I'd be curious to know what, if any options we would have for either like subsidized or sliding scale for um, families who may need access, but maybe can't afford the, um, the current price point. So just something to think about if you haven't already. Uh, that's a good question. I can tell you we've talked about it, but we have not come up with a, a final solution or what that would necessarily look like. But that is one of those areas where uh, we have talked about it and would like to obviously figure out some way of doing that, and especially not offering or taking the federal or state aid. I mean, it is through Fund 80, so there might be some opportunities. Thank you. I'm excited. All right. Uh, that doesn't appear to be any further questions. All right, we'll move on. Uh, next is policy revisions, deletions. First reading. I'll let someone uh, provide some of the background on this. I can jump in. Susan Manning already gave a good preview of that. So this is just uh, one of our normal uh, NEOLA updates. We, we get two a year generally. Um, so there are a large number. So this is not the entire update because of the large volume of number of policy revisions. Our committee has uh, chosen to break it up into parts. And so this is the result of, uh, uh, I think, three meetings up to this point to get through. And uh, um, so the goal would be to get these um, revisions approved here, you know, these next two meetings, and then another slate uh, coming to the board for consideration, um, you know, moving on for the, the rest of the update. So just to point out um, at, as an attachment there, the, um, the one that the attachment says volume 30, number two, that's just a, a real brief summary that comes from Neil that talks a little bit about, you know, the rationale for some of these policy revisions, but uh, as has been mentioned, as you know, our policy committee members go through in, in great detail and, and, and examine these and uh, uh, by no means simply rubber stamp NEOLA re, um, recommendations. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. Well, and, you know, again, um, I encourage anybody that kind of questions how we do the, the review itself to just come and watch the first 30 minutes of a policy meeting because you can see how that works. And again, um, basically what you'll do is you'll look in that volume 30, number two, and the policy will be there and they'll tell you why they're making the revision. So for instance, we made three policy revision on three different policies um, maybe it was four, just to change the language about retail tobacco sales. Um, so every time there's a change in administrative code or a statute or um, some type of language, that comes to us. And so when you get this stack of, of um, policies in this kind of case, it's basically clarification pieces to bring us in alignment 
with changes in administrative code or statutes um, or case law. Um, and we review every line, every statute, every piece of it before we, Dan looks at it, meets with the Neola rep. Um, he brings that language plus the language out of the volume to us. And then we search, we research the language ourselves and bring that to the committee meetings. Um, this is an incredibly, there sometimes it's 48 hours of work on, on the policy work. And, and I can't thank Susan and Elizabeth enough for the work that they've been, and Dan, of course, um, uh, on when we get the packet, the volume packet like this. Um, I think there are 20 policies here. We still have like another 20 to do. Um, we're meeting next week and then we'll probably meet again the week after to try and finish these. Thank you, Susan. Uh, next is Susan, or Susan Fox and then Peter. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out the, the, the Neola summary. If you have questions, it is helpful if you maybe look at that first because it might answer it. It also might not. Sometimes they're a little vague. We have a lot of discussions. We send Dan back to get more information on why they're making a change. But the one Susan just cited is a really good example where they, I think there were four policies affected by that one phrase and that's all the changes. So, but I did want to point out there is one new one here um, on, let me find the number again now, on the school report card. So number 2700.01 is a new policy about school performance and state accountability report card just because we were asked to flag those um, just as one example, but yeah, it, it is helpful because Dan does always include that Neola summary. And I think it, it's useful for you just to kind of skim through it. Well, I think the other thing that's helpful to know, it, it, you know, what we had to do was we had to look at 0174.2 school performance report, the recommendation for deletion. Then we went to the 2700.01 and made sure that anything that we thought was important to be in 0171 point whatever it was um, is now included in in the new policy so again when when you see a deletion if you have a question just ask us because usually it's moved into another policy or there's a new policy that's titled better than the old policy. So Thank you. those two were interrelated. Okay, Peter. Um, I just have a, it's just a procedural question here, which is that I look at this and I notice that the uh, revised, the proposed revisions are not available to the public on board docs. They're not in the public content, just in the administrative content, which means that I can look at them, but the public can't. Um, my view would be that at the point that they're brought to the board, I think that we should just, we should make the revisions available to the public. Uh, in the I've advocated for that for, for at least five years. Um, Dan, do you want to speak to that? Sure, I'm glad to. Uh, so first of all, there's a practical reason. Um, the way board docs is set up, these are in draft, and the only way you can view them is if you have login information. So I, we can't make them accessible. If I had these links in the public, they wouldn't work. So that's on a practical thing. Um, so I will from time to time get questions um, from individuals about wanting to see that. And of course they're you know, um, subject to review as to whether or not they're public records. Generally when they're in draft form, um, they may or may not be, but I generally share. I mean, I, I, there'd be no reason to withhold if someone wanted to see them. Then we just have to print off a copy as a PDF and, and share out that way. I'm not. I'm not entirely satisfied with that answer that we have a technological problem that keeps keeps us people from being able to click through them the way I can. And I, I understand uh, I understand where we are, but and yeah, I believe that you know presented before the board at this point, they you know they should be presented to the public uh, uh, available to the public at this point. So if there's some become some technological way to solve that problem, I think we should uh, take advantage of it. Well, we can ask, Dan, it's effectively, again, we talked about this when you first came, but it, right now it's effectively a Neola issue. Is that correct? 
Well, that's with regard to the links. I mean, it's, it's a whole separate question about, you know, there's a lot of documents that board members receive that are in draft form and that may or may not be public records. But uh, in this case, if anyone asks, we'll, we'll get them copies. Yeah. They're on they're on board docs, not Neola. They're, you know, the drafts are on our, our, board, our board doc site, not on the Neola site. So the fact that we can't make them available is a board docs problem, not a Right, you, you'd have to almost make them all word documents, which for some of these is just kind of not worth the time and effort when it's one phrase. It's, it's just, it's a lot of time spent to not. Do I know. It. So yeah, it's, I, I think, I mean, I guess I'm satisfied with the fact that if people are interested, curious about a specific one and ask for it, we can make it a word document and send it to them. But for now, and, it, and you I know, think it's become, it's become an issue with one of the things we always try to do or often try to do is look at what other districts have as well. And because everybody, so many people are using Word docs now, sometimes if we're already logged into ours, it's difficult to log into other districts. You almost have to log out of ours and then go, um, which I've done, but it's tedious. And so it is a Word docs thing. Um, it'll, it'll say, it'll yeah. deny permission to look at their policies, public policies, if we're already logged into our own system. So it's very, it's interesting, but. Susan Manning? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Susan Manning, did you have something to share? Okay, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, and, and actually to that point on the policy adoption that you had earlier that you actually took action on, um, I, since there was only one policy, it was really easy, right? So I did PDF that and put in the public content um, because also the policy, first of all, yeah, we want to share and, and people to see and, and uh, whether anyone actually is looking at it or not is another question, but... Uh, we thought let's put it out there so yeah it, it can easily be done i mean that you know we, we, these are done presented at a public meeting and, and presumably if the public wants to weigh in on these they need to have an opportunity to do that now this is the first draft uh the first reading but certainly by the uh um uh, and they're available for me to read but not available for the public to read which kind of I do think partly defeats the purpose of the first reading. So at the very least, they should be available to the public before we vote on them. Like the second read, like the revision was today. Well, Dan, we could because, put that on the agenda. Oh, Susan for Manning. Our, Susan could, Manning. Can yeah, you we could put that on our agenda for our policy meeting, right? For discussion. Uh, Susan Fox. I guess I'm satisfied with the fact that if people request that they can get it at this point, unless there becomes a less cumbersome way to do it. I mean, our attorneys have reminded us continually that back in the days before we had board docs and we had all that paper, everything was in paper handed to us or delivered to our door. There's nothing in state statute that says that the entire board packet is available necessarily to the public. It was up to us to kind of pick and choose. And thankfully now, now that's kind of become less of an issue because most of it automatically is because it's on board docs but there's not a legal requirement for that when it's a draft. Um, and I think given the fact that, as Dan has said, if someone's interested and they ask, you know, an example might be that new report card policy. I mean, if you read it, they're not, it's not gonna be, there's nothing controversial about it, but somebody might see that as a new policy and say, oh, I'm curious what that says. I mean, it might be, maybe it'd be nice to flag to uh, PDF new ones. Um, you know, some are significant, some aren't, but, um, we can we can put it on a policy agenda. I'm personally satisfied with the way it works now, given the constraints that we have with board docs. I mean, I, I do think public does have access if they ask. It's just they just have to ask. Hey, it doesn't appear to be any other questions. Uh, next is future meeting dates. Uh, so they are all listed on in board docs. Next meeting is October 20th, uh, the board workshop, strategic planning at five. And just a note on November 23rd, um, our meeting's on a Tuesday uh, due to Thanksgiving break. All right, and next is adjournment. Can I please have a motion? I move we adjourn. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, ayes have it. Motion is carried. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.